Over many years, a scientific survey was conducted in the United States. The researchers were astonished by the results. They found 50 million people creating a new culture with new ways of life, values and worldviews. In the mainstream media, this seldom gets any mention. Today, they number approximately 200 million around the world. One thing they have in common is the belief that they are alone. For this film, we have visited many countries to show you how these people are changing the world. And now, imagine a country in the middle of the United States whose citizens are the cultural creatives. Avez-vous entendu parler d'un groupe de gens appelés les Culturales Creativos Non. 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 Pas du tout. Non, pas du tout. Our clients are culture creatives, all of them, that's actually what we cater for. And they are, have very deep concerns about the environmental direction of the planet as a whole and the financial system as a part of it. We're here at the Guyam headquarters, uh, just right outside of Boulder, Colorado. Uh, near Denver um, and we are one of the largest um, environmental and cultural creative focused businesses in the US. Maybe 10 years or so ago that somebody gave me um, the Paul Ray and Terry Anderson's book, The Cultural Creatives. We need the cultural creatives very badly if that world is to be, well, one that's creative, one that allows um, the human spirit to grow and prosper. The cultural creatives I think it's an opportunity in this crisis to um, find each other, to collaborate on resources and to develop as much as is possible some workable paradigms. The new cultures that emerge, or called, often called simply as a general term, emergent cultures, uh, specifically as Paul Ray's uh, named them in America, the culture of creatives, is a sign of waking up. If I think about why I did the cultural creative research. The thing that comes to mind is that I'm looking for the people who can be the carriers for a major cultural change in society. Well, our company, American Lives, we were puzzled by the question. Why is it cultural creatives know more about the dangers of the world, know more about what's happening, they're better informed about climate change, and yet they're optimistic about what they can do for the future? And the answer I got in studies of ecological sustainability was, well, we've tried stuff and it works. And the more we've tried, the better it works. There was a meeting in London and it was the first time that government ministers were at a meeting that was explicitly uh, based around looking at peak oil as an issue. And it was quite confidential that it was happening. So there was academics, people from industry, people from business, and two of us from Transition Network, which is a young organisation, not, not three years old really, which is looking at community responses to all of this. So it felt like uh, a historic occasion but it also felt quite extraordinary that a young organisation has already had such an impact that it's seen as being uh, something that really needs to attend a meeting like that. My father always used to say, how come when we want to buy a house or build a house, the first thing we do is we go to the bank to get a mortgage. What's really important about this work is that the cost of the materials, we say, is approximately one-third of the cost of traditional homes. We've discovered that being green, being a sustainable organization, um, being an organization with a conscience, as I like to think of it, um, does not need to be an expensive venture. Frequently we'll have people who come to find out about Ithaca Hours and they'll say to us, well what makes an Ithaca Hour dollar a dollar just because you say that it's worth a dollar? 
and then we'll say, well, what makes a $1 be a $1? I had a sense that we needed to engage the corporate world because the corporate world was clearly as part of the problem, was also part of the solution. So uh, when we moved to the Netherlands, we set up a small consultancy organization, myself, another colleague, Arian Boss, and my brother, Tim. And um, we set up an, a small organization which was basically designed to um, help us earn a living to do what we cared about. And the key decision we made at that time is we were never going to compromise the work that we felt we needed to do um, because of money. We had a kind of deep trust that if we were doing what we were meant to be doing and we were passionate about it and there was a need in the world, then the resources would flow. Naja, unsere Idee von Politik ist, dass die Menschen ihr Leben selber in die Hand nehmen und ihr Leben gestalten. Das heißt, wir fangen mit uns selber an, mit unserem Innenleben, mit unseren Gedanken, mit unseren Emotionen, mit unserem sozialen Zusammenleben, mit unseren Strukturen und äh, wie wir unsere Arbeit gestalten wollen. Wir entscheiden als Gruppe äh, eben, wie wir mit Lebensmitteln umgehen, mit Energie, mit Wasser. Und die Grundidee ist eigentlich, dass sich das auf die ganze, das ganze Leben ausdehnt. Also, dass Menschen überhaupt viel mehr in die Lage kommen, individuell zu entscheiden, wie sie leben wollen und wie sie sich einbringen. Und die direkte Demokratie ist natürlich die politische Fortsetzung davon. Also, dass Menschen viel öfter und viel mehr gefragt werden, was sie wollen, wie sie Dinge haben wollen und auch einbezogen werden in politische Entscheidungen. Also nicht nur alle vier Jahre mal ein Kreuz machen und dann machen die Politiker hinterher doch was anderes, sondern dass wirklich ähm, Politik wieder eine Sache der Menschen wird. Eine Politik von unten und am besten noch, wie wir gerne sagen, auch eine Politik des Herzens. Also weil Politik geht ja nicht darum, Strukturen zu bestätigen oder aufrechtzuerhalten, sondern es geht um die Menschen. Und das dürfen wir heute nicht mehr vergessen. There was an emerging subculture, a different way of life, a group within the United States, and then it turned out they were also within Western European and Japanese civilizations as well. This emerging population was neither traditional nor the dressed for success moderns, but people who were strong on both the inner directed kinds of psychological development, even spiritual development, and very engaged in big issues of our time. This new culture is growing very rapidly. Ten years ago, or the late uh, 1990s, uh, for example, in America, 2% of the population, now perhaps 25%, and now perhaps uh, in Italy, uh, almost 30%, in other parts of, of, of Europe as well, in Japan as well. Alleine in Deutschland gehen die Schätzungen von 8 bis 20 Millionen. Also mindestens 8 Millionen von 80 Millionen Menschen sind kulturell kreative Menschen. Talking about how many cultural creatives there are is a useful device for highlighting that this is a major change. The question of how many people do you need to pull off a fundamental change in society is not clear. For example, the Renaissance in Europe was done with 50,000 people. 50,000 isn't a heck of a lot of people. Of course, the population of Europe wasn't as big at the time of the Renaissance 500 years ago as it is today either. We just had an initiative, a democratic initiative, to get this complementary medicine, as it's called here in Switzerland, into the constitution of the, of the country. And this was very successful. Nearly 70% of the people wanted to have this. Really what Bioneers has been about from the beginning was what we call a declaration of interdependence. We look at not just what would be considered strictly environmental issues, but we look at social justice, at the economy, um, inequity, you know, poverty. These are all very closely connected and you can't solve one without solving them all. Certainly, according to the studies which are known, one of the characteristics of the cultural creatives is a sense of isolation. They're convinced they're alone. They're convinced that they and their friends are unique in the world. And I don't know where all these other people came from, but I know it's just that what I think is just me and a couple of my friends. Why do they keep having this delusion when we know there's millions and millions and millions of them? One reason they feel alone is that they don't talk to other people about what they value. And they don't talk about it at their work and they don't talk about it at church or synagogue or wherever they go. They don't talk about it in their children's school. 
So they're sort of undercover, they're sort of under the radar. Um, I've met many people who say to me, well, there's nobody where I work who has these values. And I'll say, how do you know? And they'll say, well, they never talk about it. And I'll say, do you talk about it? They'll say, no, I wouldn't dream of it. The difference is between focusing on the parts and trying to stitch them together to focusing on the whole and understanding that that whole system of organizations that may need to work together to solve a certain problem has an, has an energy to it, has energy in it. So those parts are actually already related to each other. And that we, through, if we take a, um, a perspective rooted in, say, quantum physics, then it, and, they, and some of the, the energetic research that's been done by Princeton University, for example, understanding that our mind influences matter, 28 years of engineering research to prove that, it kind of changes the way we think about how we influence our reality. Well, we're in Princeton, where Princeton University had for many years a laboratory called Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research. I worked there from 1980 to 2002, and uh, somewhere in the mid-90s started doing some research with random number generators in the midst of groups, asking if there's such a thing as a group consciousness that we could pick up. That expanded um, ultimately into what's now called the Global Consciousness Project, um, which I started in 1997. It took a few months to get the equipment and write the software, but we have been now running for, well, it's getting close to 12 years. And the um, experiment, the Global Consciousness Project, is about trying to find out if there's such a thing as a global consciousness, the really big group. And so um, our research essentially asks if there's a big event in the world, something that really draws attention from perhaps millions of people, is it possible that our network of random number generators spread around the world might pick up some indication of the, the presence of a kind of global consciousness? Cultural creatives in the San Francisco Bay Area are more like each other than they're like the ones in Louisiana, but they're also, they're also more like each other than, than people who are not cultural creatives in the Netherlands, and they're more like the ones in Amsterdam, and on and on and on. You can start making pairwise comparisons, and every time, every time what would happen is to say, yep, it really is true. Uh, what's going on is the cultural creatives look like each other, no matter where they are. Many, many philosophers and psychologists have talked about things like synchronicity and uh, maybe even a kind of universal um, presence of uh, ideas. One of the most prominent is Carl Jung. We're not really so much into defining and discussing the philosophy. We're just doing an experiment. When a large number of people share thoughts and especially emotions, then um, we think that's the conditions for changes in our random number generator network. For example, Triodos Bank, which is a bank in uh, the Netherlands, which is a green bank, did a comparative advertising study of cultural creatives and moderns in uh, the two different ways of life, two different ways of perceiving, for the purpose of saying what should our ads look like in six different countries in Europe. That was when we discovered that the cultural creatives in Europe and the United States all were more like each other in the way they took nonverbal visual imagery than the ones who were in their own country. And it was a stunning difference. So it was literally the case that cultural creatives look like a style of getting and using information, a way of thinking about what they're seeing about the world that is different than their own fellow countrymen in their own country. Ethical banking or, or, or sustainable banking um, is, for, for many people it's very hard. What, what is it? Uh, because everyone should be ethical, uh, that's pretty normal. 1968 was a period where new IDs came in and uh, 
there was then a group of people uh, who were bankers, consultants, but most of the people inspired by, uh, by the works of Rudolf Steiner. Um, and they wanted to think about other ways to use money on a more authentic way and try to see if you can really use money as a development tool rather than making money with money. Die GLS Bank ist die erste sozialökologische Universalbank der Welt. Es gibt kaum Prozesse, die hier ähm, so sind wie bei anderen Banken. Es ist wirklich alles anders. Für mich ist Ethical Banking is being very aware who you lend money to. Conscious um, planning and conscious doing what we want to do. Not being stock noted, no speculation, we don't pay bonuses. What is money? That's a good question. It's mostly missing. <laughs> that uh, money is the one taboo that people don't talk about. We talk about our sex lives, we talk about our drug problems, we talk about our psychological things, but money people don't talk about. So we broke through that taboo and people start to talk about, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but I never have any extra money. So once we started to talk about it, we find out this is the case with everybody. During the Great Depression in the 30s, all of a sudden there were many, many local currencies, although they had always existed. But at the time of the Great Depression, then they became more widespread and more common. Uh, you know, in a place like New York City, where maybe I think there were 25%, 30% of the people were unemployed. So what do you do? And this was at a time when there weren't credit cards, you know, so people couldn't even borrow money, and yet they have to continue to live. So that's what they would do, is they would create these systems that would be for use in the neighborhood. Where would the money come from? If you go on the internet, um, or if you go into a banking system, where does it come from anyway? It's just all written up on a, I don't know, in the ether somewhere. And anyone knows in the banking system, it, it will write up, um, it will create credit out of nowhere and cancel it out of nowhere. So that's just a question of if we're all a party to that process, it doesn't need to be a, uh, a process which only goes on so-called inside the banking system. And today it doesn't go on inside the banking system, it goes on wherever people understand the process. So if you go to Zopa online or any number of these things, Someone will write on the internet, I need $10,000 in the back of beyond to do whatever I want to do. And the bank might say, well, that's a joke or whatever. But all that person needs is someone or some group of people who've got together $10,000 and willing to send it by internet to that person. That the financial crisis has helped in a way to make people conscious about what banks are doing and are still doing. They are not changing that much. I have a friend, Elizabeth Saturis, who's a biologist who is doing things in the Amazon to help the natives survive. And she once asked a Brazilian banker, well, you're doing things that are killing off the Amazon. Isn't this going to harm your own children? And he did this. He said, don't talk to me about that. I can't think about it. When you talk personally to, uh, to bank managers, I think they quite as a person agree with the model that we follow and they, and they respect very much this model. The question is, are they as an individual able to change the system? They are also prisoner of a system. If they, they manage a bank, they have shareholders and shareholders have a certain behavior and so they have to take this into account and the question is, do they have the courage, do they, they, they can afford to take the risk? of changing some things in their behavior with the risk that they lose their job if it is not successful on the financial side. So this is a very big dilemma for bank managers. The future of finance, or even current finance, really is a function of our consciousness, straightforward. And the more we walk that talk, the more we become conscious of this, the less unstable it will be, the less complicated it will be. Really what we're witnessing is a transformation and that means there has to be a death as well as a rebirth. And um, the system that we have needs to die. It does not work. What it does is it concentrates wealth and it distributes poverty. And it's profoundly anti-democratic and it is devouring the planet. So the question that we really face is how can we imagine redesigning the economic and social system given this crisis and, of course, given past crises as well. The essential thing about capital or the evolution of what I call capital economy 
dating, let's say, from the Renaissance, is the appearance of double entry bookkeeping. Now, this you can change your whole understanding of the universe. So, if when people were taught financial literacy in their youth, as I think they ought to, they would be taught a history of economics which would be far less political than the current, current one is, far more understanding of the nature of capital, um, far more linked to, I think, fairly classic understandings of, of finance than often financial teachings are, deep politicized without any ideology pushing behind it. Um, they would also be led to double entry bookkeeping as the technique on which the whole modern economy completely depends. If you were to teach double entry bookkeeping to people, they could never have a capitalist socialist divide in their minds. It would never arise. And this technique, if I put in a certain image, means you have to be aware of your motives in doing something and of the effects you have on those around you. Transition started about four years ago with some work I was involved with in Ireland and then Totnes, which is quite close to here, became the first uh, transition initiative in the UK. And since then it's spread and spread, so there are now over 350 formal transition projects uh, and then thousands of what we call mullers, ones who are mulling whether to become formal initiatives or not. There are now national transition organisations, sort of national hubs in the US and Canada, Australia, Australia, New Zealand, Italy, Sweden. The Netherlands is a, seems to be a very ripe uh, place for this kind of um, work. So the last few years we've been developing something we call mesh working, which is an approach to collaboration across sectors um, to be able to engage some of the complex challenges that we're facing. Columbia County has the per capita the largest number of organic and biodynamic farms in America. We like to think of the farm as a living organism itself, and I think biodynamics is making an attempt to reconnect, say, ancient wisdom with modern understanding. I mean, GAIM's a, a unique organization structure in terms of it being very flat and non-traditional. Um, there's a tremendous amount of interaction um, from the lowest level of the organization to the highest level. We have uh, meetings that, that in, include every level of the organization, from Yorka, our CEO and founder, all the way down to people that work in customer service. It's extremely important for us that uh, the voice of the customer is heard, and so that anybody that has an opportunity to interact with a customer um, has a seat at the table with any of our executives. Um, it's a very passionate place to work because we're very fortunate, especially being near Boulder, which is a cultural creative hub, that many people um, want to tie their work life and their personal life and passion together and they see us as being a great employer for that. I mean, they can come here and we have free yoga and fitness classes, we have our own uh, garden on campus, an organic garden on campus. We're the largest corporate uh, solar installation in the state of Colorado. We have a organic and local cafeteria on site. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of you know, activities and participations are value-based for our employees and as a result they're more engaged in the decisions that we make and therefore more vocal and I think we get a tremendous advantage of the passion of our employees. When I first got involved with their ice cream it, um, it was already a natural ice cream shop, um, first one ever in Boulder and so that was something that I did like about the company when I bought it and wanted to continue. Our warehouse here is primarily lit with skylights. So number one, I've reduced our electric bill. I've made us a more efficient, less costly company to operate, let alone you know, the, the decrease in the carbon footprint. We heat our entire plant here with hot air that would normally be waste air coming off of our compressors that cool the freezers. That didn't cost us any more to do. Um, and in fact, it substantially decreased our heating bills. In um, January, we do have one gas furnace up here. And in January, we paid $1 to run that um, in Boulder, Colorado in the middle of winter. And to combat that in the summertime, because I know the follow-on question is, well, don't you die of heat in the summer? Um, we put in three attic fans into the side of our building that exhaust all of that hot air out during the summertime. What happens when a corporation is faking it, not just in terms of greenwashing, but other kinds of faking it, like faking that they're a cultural creative corporation because they want to sell to cultural creatives? Well, who can spot that faster than another cultural creative? So if they don't hire cultural creatives to be their spokespeople, and, and if the spokespeople then come across the inauthentic message, 
what happens next is the cultural creatives really get offended and so they just trash a company. There was a company that put out um, clothing, a line of fairly expensive clothing called J. Peterman. And Peterman is an example of a classic direct marketing and catalog failure. It was going straight up like this because it had wonderful stories. Cultural creatives love stories as part of the, uh, what they're, they're buying or when they hear things in the news, they would rather hear a story than anything. And uh, Peterman had these wonderful long stories about how the pro they got the product or who, somebody who used it and so on. And it turned out that the advertising guys were making it up and faking it and the cultural creatives found out and Peterman immediately crashed. 90% of their market had been cultural creatives and they, they faked it and they died for it. Just like that. And uh, it was a marvelous lesson into a lot of advertising agencies is that faking it with cultural creatives is extremely difficult. A really important thing that was happening through Bioneers was that people were getting connected and social networks were forming and cross-pollination was occurring among many different kinds of people in many different fields, many different cultures. And so um, this woman, I guess just about nine or ten years ago from Toronto, called us up after the conference and said, you know, I love coming to Bioneers, but what I really want is to bring Bioneers to Toronto, because I live here and this is what I care about is my place. So she said, why don't you broadcast it? And that was the origin of our Beaming Bioneers program. Um, where we, the conference takes place over three days and each morning for, there are five keynotes for about four hours. So we just decided to experiment and um, we beamed it up by satellite so that local communities could download it and um, organize their own conference around that, self-organize it. So they would have a binders component from California and then they would basically feature their own issues, local speakers, local issues, and bring together their local community to surface local solutions. If, if people want to make a difference, they should not just change their own lifestyles. You hear a lot of that. Well, if we all do this or that, everything will be fine. No, everything won't be fine. It will improve your own situation probably, but it won't change things politically particularly, if, but you have to do things with other people. So I would say change whatever you like, change your lifestyle, don't drive a car, change your light bulbs, whatever, but join an organization, work with other people on some aspect of the crisis that interests you particularly, and then try from there also to make contacts with other organizations so that on specific issues and at specific times you can come together. Nobody's saying stop doing what you're doing. The only thing that is important is X, Y, or Z. No. Do what you think is the most important, but recognize that there are moments when uh, everyone has to come together. One, uh, a fellow named Tom Lindsay, for example, um, started working with many local communities in, in western Pennsylvania, which is actually an extremely conservative region uh, politically. But what these communities were finding, which have a lot of, um, of a tradition of family farming and small farms, was that corporate agribusiness had targeted their region and was moving in these giant animal factory farms. So they came to this lawyer, Tom Lindsay, and said, how do we stop them? And he said, well, by the law, you can't actually stop them. You can only regulate how fast or how slowly they poison your environment. And this was destroying water tables. It was destroying the air quality. People were getting asthma. It was a very, very bad situation. And so they said, well, that's not good enough. We just want to say no. We don't want them here at all. So he wrote ordinances. And then ultimately, some of the communities wrote their own local constitutions that simply banned corporate farming altogether. That was it. And they removed what are called corporate rights and said that the community rights superseded those corporate rights. And this sounds unlikely, and it's especially unlikely because it's coming from the most unlikely people, which is hardcore conservatives. But they were fed up and they were watching their communities and their quality of life being destroyed. So this has spread around the U.S. to quite a number of communities now, and it's percolating up to the federal level um, because of this recent Supreme Court decision 
that is essentially allowing corporate political free speech, which means it's not free at all. It's incredibly expensive now. And of course, no citizen can afford those costs. Um, there's actually a movement now to create what's called the 28th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which would remove corporate rights and, um, you know, take it back to where it's supposed to be. It's truly amazing where Cal Earth is now because the journey that my father went on to get to this point was very difficult. It was full of challenges, full of obstacles, people constantly standing in his way. You know, he came from Iran to the United States, back to Iran, back to the United States, all around the world, telling people, fighting with the building department, fighting with local people who couldn't see the vision that he had, but he still continued. No matter what anyone said or whatever anybody did, he had this quest. Now that they've gone to an international building code here in California, and once we get our plans updated to the most recent code this year, it'll be even easier um, throughout the world for people to be able to do this work. We've had it been built all throughout the world, and just for the fact that it was built here in California in this seismic zone, it makes it significantly more accessible in all the rest of the parts of the world um, because we've been able to prove it here in this very difficult climate. There's a poem by Rumi that says, Earth turns to gold in the hands of the wise. A lot of people want to do it and find a way so that they can build it for themselves, that they can use solar and wind and lower their bills and live in something that's sustainable that they know will last and that will also be good for the environment that isn't causing more carbon footprint. It is now uh, in this rural county uh, one of the largest employers. We have 150 people working here. We have an extremely innovative way that we deal with our, our health insurance that now as people are saying Ooh, in this health care crisis in this country and we just had our, 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 our uh, rates reset and zero percent rate increase, zero percent after last year's less than 2%. Well, our insurance agent says, unprecedented, never have seen this happen. You know, and I'm not an insurance agent, so I, don't, I have to take his word for that. But I do know that uh, people in the county and other businesses who are struggling to, to uh, deal with the health insurance question say, when they hear that we're still offering full health, dental, life insurance, um, and we're still paying 90% of the premium, and we're actually able to encourage complementary therapies. We have this, this self-insurance pool that we can work with uh, along with our outside provider. They say, this is really innovative. Okay, this is a new way of approaching it. This is good. So in the county, when, when you see, because we're a small county and a rural county and there's not a lot of large businesses, we, we kind of stick out a little bit as 150 employees and uh, about, say, roughly $10 million of, of financial activity. Gemeinschaften werden in der allgemeinen Presse und Fernsehen viel zu wenig erwähnt. Ich bin immer wieder erstaunt, wie viele Menschen keine Ahnung haben, dass es große existierende Gemeinschaften gibt, die alle sagen, ach, das war mal in den 70ern und hat sich dann überlebt. Und wenn sie dann herkommen, denken sie, oh, wenn ich das gewusst hätte. Also es ist oft so ein richtiges Erstaunen, dass ähm, auch viele große Gemeinschaften längst über die Anfangsschwierigkeiten mit Spüldienst oder Arbeitsverteilung hinaus sind, sondern funktionierende Wirtschaftssysteme eigentlich aufgebaut haben, von denen andere auch profitieren können. Wir leben hier auf einem Gelände von 15 Hektar mit vielen bereits bestehenden Gebäuden, die wir so gekauft haben. Und da ist, ist unsere ökologische Arbeit nicht der Neubau von Häusern, sondern die Altbausanierung. If I now see that Ultimately, we're not going to create the reality we need to create through trying to change the old system. What do we do? And I was reminded of a Buckminster Fuller quote, uh, which said, you can't, uh, don't try to change the old system, but uh, build a new, a new one that makes the old obsolete. So where at some point, you know, the new is mature enough to be able to take over the helm, as it were, from the old system. A lot of us in our kind of campaigning mindset or, or in our um, disappointment and frustration at the state of the world blame the current leadership and demand that they change things. Um, but the current leadership, you know, has to keep the lights on, has to keep us supplied with food, has to keep our societies running, has to keep our organizations running. And they don't really have the space to radically think about how to do things completely different because they have to keep things running. 
And it ultimately it's the responsibility of people like me and uh, this kind of these kind of people to um, create the new systems as quickly as we can that are going to be mature enough to take over from the old system. It's not the responsibility of a current leadership. We can't demand from them that they need to create the new system. What we can suggest that they do is create the space for experimentation and research um, so that the new can emerge. Um, but ultimately, we need to take responsibility for creating that new system, and, and we need to do that as quickly as possible. Conventional medicine is very expensive. It can also be quite dangerous or harmful, and many treatments simply don't really work very well. Um, and I, I don't at all want to uh, put down Western medicine. It has many virtues, and if I got run over by a truck, I'd be very happy to be in the emergency room, and there are many good things about Western medicine. Here in the U.S. now, um, more people actually uh, pay a visit to an alternative practitioner than to a doctor. That occurred several years ago, that, that tipping point. I think a big signal in Switzerland was the, um, was the vote for, uh, to, re to have the uh, complementary medical approaches, so of which anthroposophical medicine is one, homeopathy and then traditional Chinese medicine, to have these uh, included again in the basic medical aid, in the basic insurance. You know, that was uh, in, as, as law that it has to be included. So I think that's a very strong signal that people are wanting this. One basic um, uh, element of anthroposophical medicine is the threefold and the fourfold man. And the threefold man being that, you, that one views the human being as, let's say, as in, in parts, and those being the nerve senses system, the rhythmical system, and the metabolic system. Uh, for anthroposophical medicine, the, the remedies that we use, the medicines that we use, the therapies that we, we use are typically not covered by any insurance, no matter how, how much coverage the patient has. They're just, those things are not considered uh, covered services uh, because of the way the insurance laws or the insurance companies have, have the right to decide what they want to cover and what they don't want to cover. There's a, an economic war between doctors and what would be called alternative or complementary medicine. But beneath that is a conflict of medical opinion, a kind of a medical civil war philosophically that's been going on for centuries. And the core of it is that what we would now call allopathic or conventional medicine uh, grows out of a tradition called heroic medicine, which was based on the premise that your body has no ability to cure itself and the doctor needed to intervene heroically often with treatments like mercury or surgery before there was anesthesia and asepsis, you know, infection control and so forth. And, um, and on the other side, what you find in empirical medicine or what would be now called natural medicine, um, the basic premise was that as a healer, what you want to do is stimulate the body to cure itself because the body has remarkable uh, capacity for self-repair and for healing, which we really understand very little about. We can know things to do that will make that happen, but we may not know why it happens. Sometimes people say the herbs haven't really been tested for medicine. And I'm the first one to say the herbs have been tested. They've been used by millions of people for thousands of years. And to me, that is much more relevant than a two-year rat study <laughs> or even a drug that is newly introduced into the marketplace and everyone's all excited about it. And then six months later, there's a recall because we find out now that it's been launched in the public that there's side effects that are dangerous or even life-threatening. What we've really witnessed, I think, is that a lot of people are getting satisfaction from natural medicine. Um, they wouldn't keep doing it if they didn't. And they generally report that they find better treatment as a human being. They're, you know, I think the average time that a doctor spends with you, um, or the, if you try to ask a question or make a statement, they cut you off after eight seconds. So there's not a lot of dialogue in the conventional system, and I think people don't like that. Yeah, we have, um, since we've been here, which is uh, now almost 13 years in Ann Arbor, we have had a very close relationship with the University of uh, Michigan Medical School, and we have students who come to our office and residents sometimes, and we work together with our colleagues there, and we also go to the university to participate in alternative medicine um, group 
um, discussions with the with the medical students to, to teach them a little bit about our orientation. We need to be re-educated because we've really been bamboozled, I'd like to say, meaning uh, thought that everything needs to come from a store and that we're powerless. One of the things that's really special about raw food is it contains enzymes. And enzymes are the spark of life. We know that enzymes reduce inflammation. And we're also finding out in our modern times that almost all diseases are inflammatory in nature. Let's talk about the social movements that the cultural creatives have grown out of, because some of the movements are very visible, like the uh, battle in Seattle, the people who are demonstrating in the streets against the World Trade Organization back around uh, 1999 and 2000. What the battle in Seattle was about was stopping the World Trade Organization, stopping them from giving in to corporations uh, and destroying the livelihoods of many people around the world. The MAI, um, the Multilateral Agreement on Investment, was being negotiated in secret at the OECD in Paris by the OECD members, which is to say the rich countries of the world. And this agreement was secret, but we in Paris got copies of it, strangely enough, through some Canadian friends. And when we read this agreement, uh, we were absolutely appalled. It said transnational corporations can even bring legal proceedings against a government if they think, if they, the transnationals, think that their future profits or present profits are being uh, prevented or destroyed by uh, the action of a government. News media refuses to cover it anymore. They've stopped covering demonstrations and they've stopped covering things that we are successful at because now that the boundary line between the business side of the of the news media and the reporter side of the news media has been dissolved, uh, the business side doesn't let the reporters uh, report on new social movements anymore. And that's a very important thing to know, is that we have an active business-oriented censorship of reporting about what cultural creatives are doing. At the beginning it was quite hard to get it uh, into the news because most reporters, most journalists said this is too technical, our readers aren't going to understand, and so on. But we did get a couple of very prestigious people to write um, op-eds, basically short uh, descriptions of this thing in the papers. And from then it took off and we were able to create an enormous amount of pressure and for the first time bring together um, groups that really had not worked together before. That was the first collection of major demonstrations that were, had been organized over the internet. So the internet made it ten times cheaper and four times faster to organize those demonstrations against the World Trade Organization. So we had a quite disparate uh, pressure center uh, made up of, of filmmakers, actually, uh, of um, people who were worried about the intellectual property aspects of this agreement, North-South solidarity organizations, women, uh, cultural people, farmers even, um, trade unions. It was uh, quite a, a remarkable coalition. They made the big mistake of putting the whole WTO in the center of Seattle, in a conference center which was right across from large hotels and right downtown. And logistically, uh, I had nothing to do with this. It was very brave, smart, young, much younger people who had been in Seattle organizing for six months. They had been teaching people nonviolent techniques so that when the conference happened, they were in a position to actually, it was a battle because it was organized, but a nonviolent battle. So you could choose your group. You, it was called an affinity group, and you could say, I 
I'm willing to stay no matter what happens. I will put chains around, I'll be next to my neighbors, and even if I'm tear gassed, I, can, I will stay. Or you could say, I have to go collect my child at school at um, 5 p.m., say, and so I want to be able to leave if I have to. People organized according to how far they wanted to go and who their affinities were. And you were responsible for the people in your affinity group. And they had doctors, they had lawyers, they had people all through in different sectors. It was beautifully organized. It may have looked rather chaotic, but it wasn't. And I was kind of a tourist in all of this because I was there for the very big meeting that we had the night before in a huge teach-in in the symphony hall which held 2,800 people, I think, and it was full and there was many people outside. And here I thought, it's happening, you know. We suddenly, I think we have a movement. I believe one of the worst things in a way would be, although I fully understand that many people individually have been um, have suffered through the crisis, through the financial crisis, is to press what I call the reset button. That uh, we've had a difficult time, we've had bad experiences, and we go back to normal, if there is such a thing as normal. Because certainly what we've experienced in the last number of years, uh, normalcy, what is normal, what we understand to be normal, is not what we want as a basis for the future. In a global economy, you, you can't, you can't wake up financially in one corner of the world. This is not possible. And so part of the problem we have is it's, it's pushing against our normal consciousness and that's our main problem. If we could just find whatever the thing is which gets us over that little hurdle, we would see we're in a completely different financial world than the one we think we're in. We're not in a world which is run against our best interest. We're in a world in which we're really not conscious of what we're doing. And I think anyone who's concerned about being manipulated just needs to take hold of his balance sheet and manipulate his balance sheet himself. If now humanity is supposed to be wide awake consciously in finance and it isn't, then people who are wide awake, they have a huge power. And, they, and I think some of those people think they're duty bound to exercise their power on behalf of the rest of humanity. I'm not, I'm not advocating that, but I think that's a perfectly understandable dynamic. And therefore the only, the only way out of it, if you don't like it, is to wake up financially. We need to learn as quickly as possible how to gracefully let go of that old system so that it can fertilize the soil for the new um, and how to, how to uh, allow the emergence of the new to come through as quickly as possible. Pain and suffering that we go through as humanity over the next years will be directly related to how attached we are to our old ways of doing things. So the more attached we are to those, and the more fearful we are about them disintegrating, the more pain we will create for ourselves and the system around us. It's a crucial fact that probably half the world's, roughly half, of the world's need for energy could be supplied by wind power alone. More than all of the energy use in the world could be supplied by solar. With today's technology, it's very important. With today's technology, not even any big technology breakthroughs, we could supply more energy with alternative energy sources than is uh, used today in the world and get rid of oil and coal altogether. All right, so it's very important that from a purely engineering standpoint, the problem is not all that bad. Rudolf Steiner had this picture that society basically has three uh, sectors or three organs. It has the economy, it has the rights sphere or the political sphere, and it has the cultural or, or spiritual spirit, sphere of the spirit. He saw each of these spheres as being totally interrelated and interconnected, but that each one was, should be governed by a certain lawfulness that was appropriate to that sphere. In the, in the economic sphere, he saw it as, uh, I'll use the word altruism. He kind of used the word fraternity or brotherhood, but in the politically correct day, you know, brotherhood excludes 51% of the population, so we'll, 
we'll go with altruism. The idea is, if I meet your needs, if, I, if my activity meets the community needs, my needs will be net, met. It's kind of turning Adam Smith's invisible hand and uh, working out of self-interest 180 degrees and to say, I'm acting out of interest in your needs and the community needs, and as a result, my needs will be met. Well, I can say unequivocally, it's a true fact because I'm, again, I pay attention more towards being in service and this job of executive director, which I like to think of as executive servant, to, to, to really be, have the privilege of serving a community. My needs have always been met. Cultural life should be characterized by freedom. So schools and hospitals and universities shouldn't be controlled by the state. They, there should be a multitude of different kinds of schools, not a state school system or one private school system. Or there should not just be Waldorf schools, there should be Catholic schools and Buddhist academies, many different kinds of schools. And if you think about it, you know, in the end, any cultural activity, whether you're an architect, a lawyer, a teacher, an artist, a university professor, all of these activities are really based on the creativity of the individual. It's not about teamwork, it's not about producing for customer demand, it's about the unique activity. And so Steiner felt, well, that should not be controlled by the state, it should be freely funded, and there should be a great variety of cultural activities. And that would lead to much more innovation in society. In the political sphere, in the rights sphere, the lawful principle guiding that is equality. We all have basic rights that we have, should have equal access to. You see in the case of the United States, we have the highest per capita population in prisons. We have uh, highest levels of juvenile delinquency, of obesity, of drug use. And you look at this range of social pathology and you realize that a lot of it, I think, has to do with uh, people not having meaningful work, uh, as well as the great gaps in wealth. Because if you think about what the media shows people all the time, it is the good life. But most people don't have the good life, and many, many people I read that over 70%, a recent study done at the Pew Center in Philadelphia on uh, the recent economic crisis, it said something like 70% of the American public has difficulty, uh, had difficulty in the last year in either making their house payments, paying their food bills, or paying their medical costs. It's ridiculous that we live in a society where in a, in a on an earth that has four billion people suffering from poverty and, and not enough food, and yet we have unemployed people. We have an incredible market if we see economic life about meeting human needs and organizing it in such a way, and I, organizing economics in such a way that is human service and need oriented. And when you do that, then you provide meaningful work. The bigger issue is become active as a citizen in your community, you know, or in your country, whatever scale you're working on. And that's really what it's about now, and connecting with other people and educating other people. And so much of this is about ignorance. People really just often don't know. That's why we do what we do with Bioneers is, you know, people need to know about these solutions. And once you know, then the question is, what do I do next? How do I put it into action? And I think this next decade is all about mobilization and action but it has to be based on knowledge and education. So it's education for action. Looking at big challenges like peak oil and climate change and trying to respond not with a motivation of, of fear and uh, hoarding and, and selfishness, but really trying to think through what a response to peak oil and climate change and resource depletion in general looks like if it's underpinned by creativity and compassion and being about connecting people together rather than them fracturing apart from each other. The question of um, who uh, is going to choose to go with the new and who is going to choose to hold on to the old um, is ultimately an individual choice. So we can't, we can never force anybody 
to change uh, their mindset or to change themselves. They can only ever change themselves by themselves. What we can do is we can create a, a very attractive invitation. And that is our, that's got to be our job, really, as cultural creatives or this kind of, these people who are interested in this, um, in this work. There are no real prescriptions for people do this or do that. That would be artificial. Think different, which means see the world differently. Re-establish what people have always had, but we have forgotten in the West in the past 200 years or so, namely your connection, your connection with other people, with the whole human community, with all living things. In a, a big, complicated society, we have millions of people concentrated in cities who are, whether they feel like they're independent or not, are literally dependent, deeply dependent on the surrounding people and on people far away from them. A small circle of friends to bring them together and to begin to raise the really deep questions. Not to find answers, but to open doors. A small group of people that are clear about their aim and focus can bring about basic change. No, you cannot wait any longer for permission to do things. This is really a time which is about taking initiative, getting on with it, and realizing that actually the solutions that we need, the responses that we need, are gonna come not from a coach load of experts coming in with a clipboard and writing us a report. It's gonna come from the people around us with the skills that they have. What prevents you from acting? And, and if um, uh, sometimes you hear, well, me as an individual, I cannot do anything. You know, I'm too small on the, or having no money or whatsoever. And, yeah, I don't buy that. Um, if you look at back at the roots, for example, from Trigels Bank, they started with uh, uh, just a few men themselves, no money whatsoever. And you see 30 years later what happens. There are thousands and thousands of those groups working. And if we saw that, we would be full of hope. The time is more than right for the idea of cultural creatives to come to the fore. Frankly, um, I think probably most people don't, you know, who are, you might say, definable as cultural creatives have no idea about it. And it but it doesn't matter because what they are, what um, the idea of cultural creatives is about, is people who are willing and able, um, ready to move. Historic once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to do something really extraordinary. That the work that we do now with the people around us uh, creating this sort of uh, response that is so needed is work that in 20 years time I'm convinced people will tell stories about, sing songs about, uh, put plaques up on the wall to this work that was done now. Think of yourself as being part of a larger unit, which is a deep spiritual experience. It's now underscored by the sciences today. It tells you that we are in, indeed connected, very, very subtly but effectively. If you feel yourself being part of a larger family, so to speak, a larger community, you will act differently. You will not act in such a way as to pursue your own interest at the expense of others. You will try to behave in a way that other people can also draw benefits from it, create the basis for a mutual benefit world. It can be done. You know, this is the most exciting time in history, I think, to be alive, because it's not just the elites, it's everybody. It involves all of us at all levels of society. And that means we're being forced to wake up. And that's, that's wonderful and hard at the same time.